My name is Nayantara, this is Jonathan, and we're very happy to now welcome Simon Hicks to the stage. Welcome. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thanks. So you want me over here? Yes. yes. Perfect. Over there. So welcome. Uh, you are currently a professor at Florence European University, but before that, you were at LSE for a long time, which used to be a part of the EU not too long ago. <laughs> Is it fair to say that Boris Johnson forced you out of your country? Um, yes, I think you could probably say that. No, it's not quite true. I mean, if the timing was right for me. Um, Brexit happened at the same time as my kids left home, so... <laughs> It was, it was time to think about, maybe it's, I've been in London for 25 years, my wife's American, she's always saying, when are we moving? <laughs> so, so, you know, we were looking around and Florence came up and so we moved to Florence two years ago. So, yeah. And it's not a bad place. Not yeah. such a bad place to be. Yeah. It's not Amsterdam, but I mean. Yeah, I mean. But Florence. <laughs> yeah. Um, you've dedicated your entire career to studying the ins and outs of European institutions. And what? a few other things, <laughs> not just and that, so but anyway, yeah. What inspired that? Well, when I was, uh, when I was a kid and I was you know, studying uh, political science and history as an undergraduate, I was very interested in Europe. I, I, I come from Brighton on the south coast of England, so it faces the continent. The rest of Britain is behind you. So every summer we'd go to the continent, we'd go to France, we'd go to Spain. So I grew up with being very close to the continent. And so I was interested in, you know, French society and, you know, German football. And, you know, so I was interested in Europe. And then I went to go study um, European integration. And at that time, the only way to study it was in international relations. So these various theories of interstate politics and and I'd been studying elections, parties, public opinion, and this kind of stuff, and, and, and also how institutions work, and nobody was doing that. So when I was writing my PhD in Florence in the 90s, um, I thought about how can you study the EU as a political system, using all the tools that we have in generally in political science to study political systems. So how do we understand public opinion? How do parties compete? How do institutions work? And so I was part of a new generation who were doing that. So, you know, I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, you almost have spearheaded this institutionalist approach to studying That's right. you. Well, not really institutionalist. I remember there was me and Mark Pollock and Amy Krapel and Karen Alter, and there was a lot of people coming to study the institutions, bringing with them the study of judicial politics or mm -hmm. legislative politics or or public opinion. Matt Garble was a big public opinion scholar. And all this, there was a new generation of scholars who didn't want to use an IR approach to, to, to study the institutions. And I think this is now the standard way of teaching and researching how the EU works. So. Oh, wow. So we want to talk to you about the upcoming European elections. Um, and maybe we can start by putting into, into some context. You've written about how voting um, back in 2014, maybe even a little bit in 2009, or more so in 2009, used to be structured along this multi-dimensional space where we had the left and the right, the traditional and the um, liberal. And that has now changed. Can you tell us about the shift? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, we've been studying European elections for quite a long time. So um, we've been building models to understand how the elections work. And mm -hmm. there's, there's two different things going on. So, so one is how, you know, generally politics in Europe has shifted from being around the sort of economic left-right dimension to now being a combination of economics and social or cultural issues. So you get a sort of liberal, um, social liberal, sort of socially liberal plus economically left-wing position against an economically right-wing and social conservative. So this was the main dimension that has been dominating European politics for the last 10, 20 years. Uh, but still cutting across that was pro and anti-Europe. So, you know, but now it looks like all of these dimensions are collapsing into one. So we're getting pro-Europeans are economically left-wing and socially liberal, anti-Europeans are economically right-wing and socially conservative. So we, you get this main dimension of politics that has evolved and changed. And so, you know, the, the battle over European integration is now becoming more conflictual in many, many party systems across Europe. And, and, and that's sort of one side of things. The other side of things is European elections are a little bit different to national elections. So in European elections, what you get is you tend to get protest votes against mainstream parties. And so 
This is why anti-European parties do particularly well in European elections compared to national elections. Okay, so we had um, integration kind of separate from the regular socioeconomic dimension, and now we have that aligning. Exactly. Why do you think that happened? When did that shift really come into the picture? Well, I think what has happened is what the EU does has changed. So, you know, it was just a process of integration, uh, and it was a sort of international political system that was being built. Now it's been built. The EU does a lot of normal things. It regulates a market. So there's a battle over should there be high environment standards or low environment standards? Should there be high labor market standards or low labor? Should the costs be imposed on business or on consumers? Um, should the EU be spending and redistributing money? Should it have a more expansionary monetary policy or a more contractionist monetary policy? Should, should, it, should it have a tr global trade agreements with the US or other countries in the world? So you know these are sort of pretty standard political issues. And the views on those issues that voters and parties take tend to be the same positions they would take on those issues domestically. So in a sense, European poli EU politics has become normal politics, if you like. And so your attitudes towards the EU tend to be endogenous or dependent on your position on a whole range of other issues. So it's not, you know, whether or not you're pro-European is now much more predicted by your attitude on a whole range of other issues. So, for example, if you like... If high environment standards, you're going to like the EU. If you like high social labor market standards, you're going to like the EU. If, you'd like, if you want more liberal markets, you tend to be more critical of the EU at the moment. If you, don't, if you're, if you think the, environment, the EU is imposing environmental costs on, on farmers or on businesses, you tend to be very anti-EU. I mean, all across Europe, we're seeing farmers' protests, and they're protesting. It's probably one of the largest European-wide anti-European protests we've ever seen coordinated. It's, we, we've never seen kind of this, this amount of people on the streets protesting about what is fundamentally an EU policy. These are the policies of environmental regulation of the EU that they're protesting against. And why does this normalization of politics, as you call it, um, polarization as well, matter so much for uh, the EU? Um, because Europe, and, it, and it gets magnified in European elections. So, you know, the European Parliament has in, increased in power over the last 20 or 30 years and is now one of the, the key legislative institutions in the EU, together with the government sitting in the council. And every five years, the Parliament gets elected, and the shape, the makeup of the Parliament really matters for what the EU does. So, for the last 20 years, the, 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 the average member of the Parliament has been a Liberal MEP sitting in the centre of group in the parliament. And so you tend to have coalitions formed to the left or to the right. So the European Parliament is much more like US Congress than national parliaments. There's no inbuilt government. So legislation or um, votes get formed issue by issue in the parliament. So you, sometimes you get coalitions formed on the left, sometimes you get coalitions formed on the right, sometimes you get big grand coalitions in the middle. And, and that has been pretty stable up to now. So you've tended to get coalitions formed on the right, with the Liberals voting with the right when it comes to regulating the market. So you tend to get kind of uh, free market liberal policies from the EU. But you tend to get a coalition on the left when it comes to environment standards, when it comes to labor market standards, when it comes to gender equality type things. And then you need to get a grand coalition in the middle on like trade, foreign policy, and so on. And that has been a very stable equilibrium for about 20 years. And so it's been pretty easy to predict what the EU is going to be doing. If you're the commissioner and you're proposing legislation, you know you're going to get a support in the parliament for environment policy, or you know you're going to get support in the parliament for you know, liberalizing markets, because a different coalition will form. This election, we're going to see a big shift rightwards as a result of that polarization on European issues. And, and we're going to see the middle member of the parliament no longer being a liberal. We're going to see the middle member of, that, of the parliament being in the EPP, in the centre-right group in the parliament. And so that could have quite dramatic impact on the type of policies we're going to see adopted by the EU. I think throughout this interview, we'll talk a lot about the radical right. Um, but one thing I want your comment on is one of the issues that maybe wasn't mentioned before, which is immigration and problem of integration. How much of that do you think explains this potential rise of the far right that we'll see in the next well, election? <laughs> No, you know, things like the rise of the populist right across Europe, or the far right, as some people want to call it, um, it's multi-causal. There's no one single factor. So, uh, and, you know, depending on where you shine your light, you can find evidence. So, you know, you've got a whole 
body of people saying it's about economics. It's about growing economic inequality, both individually and regionally. We've got regions of the country that are sort of left behind. We've seen contraction of public spending and this dis disproportionately fallen on lower income people, particularly in rural areas. And so this is overwhelmingly driven by economics. We've seen decline of manufacturing. We've seen globalization of the economy. So people say it's about economics. There's a whole other set of people say it's all about immigration. It's, you know, and, and we've seen fundamental transformations in our societies. All of Europe are now uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religious societies. We've seen transformations in our, all of our societies across Europe. Um, people who, particularly older generations, who are feeling like society is changing. So depending on where you si shine your torch, you can, you, can fo you can find economics or you can find evidence it's all social or cultural. These are multi-causal factors. Add to that now the new issue that the populist right are mobiling on, which is the environment. So they had kind of economics, and then they had migration, and now you see them mobilizing as a sort of anti-environment policy. It's not that, in a sense, some of them, sure, are climate skeptics, but most of them are not. Um, like, I don't think Wilders is probably a climate skeptic, but Wilders is mobilizing around the fact that environmental legislation is falling disproportionately on the type of voters he's trying to appeal to. So people are protesting, farmers are protesting about the costs of environmental standards. Um, other people are saying, and all across Europe, you see people saying, you know, if we want to aim for zero, net zero economy, who's going to pay for this? And it, we, us as our kind of urban liberals are saying, well, you know, let's tax cars. We don't have cars. <laughs> Right? Let, let's, you know, I, I'm willing to pay for my changing my uh, gas boiler into a heat pump. Um, so, you know, we tend to support these types of policies without thinking these things are hugely expensive and these costs fall disproportionately. So, for a long time, we talk about environment politics being what we call a valence issue, meaning everybody's in favor of it. You know, everyone, oh, yeah, I'm in favor of addressing uh, environment, I care about the climate. And it gets to a point where actually now policy has to be made, somebody has to pay, and then it moves from being a valence issue to being what we call a distributive issue. There's conflict. Who's paying? Who's going to pay the costs of the transformation and the transition in the economy? And, and when we haven't really figured that out, that really easy, that's easy for the populist right to mobilize and saying, it's not fair that these costs are being imposed. Um, why should we pay? You guys should be paying for this. And so they've added, on top of the sort of economics issues, they've added migration issues, and now they've added environment issues. And you add up those, and this is a really potent mix of policy positions for them to mobilize around. And this is happening all across Europe in every country. So do I, do I then understand correctly that um, you, you've spoken about how, how this these issues, these dimensions are align, aligning on the European dimension. But what we have is almost a two-directional situation where there's alignment in, on the European level, but also um, in nation states, and that alignment kind of reinforces each other. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So what is, in, in previous European elections, so 2014 and 2019, uh, we saw a rise in the populist right in some countries. But not, you know, in so one country we saw the populist right arising in Denmark, and then the last elections we saw big support in, in, in uh, France, um, and, and also quite a little bit in the Netherlands. And this time round, we're going to see it in many, many countries all at the same time. So this is why this is a sort of European-wide phenomenon, and why we're seeing the European issue, in a sense, conflated with those other issues I've talked about. So it's a, it's a mix that adds all these things together. Europe is blamed for the economic crisis. Europe is blamed for the migration crisis. Europe is blamed for the environmental costs. And so all of these things line up with, with the European issue. And so you get the rise in support for the populist right across many countries. So yeah, this, this is why it's a, it's a very interesting time to watch what's going to happen in June in these elections. Um, so one thing that you've predicted in your, one of your most recent papers is not only the rise of the far right or the populist right, it is also that the traditional center-left parties, uh, the Greens and the social, socialist Demo Democrats, um, are also going to do much worse. And I think you've mentioned before that they were like a major party in a lot of these environmental social justice issues, which the EU has yeah. traditionally been quite effective at making a lot of regulations. So how much can we expect, not just from the rise of the far right, but also that implosion of the traditional center-left parties, which again, 
also happens in a more national level as well. Yeah, so you've got to think about when we see the rise of new parties, you've got to think they're not coming from nowhere. So, you know, they're taking votes often from the center right, but we're seeing other things going on. And, and we're seeing a long-term decline in support for the mainstream center-left all across Europe. So, of course, we've seen the Dutch Labour Party go down a lot, then form a coalition with Green Links. Um, but, you know, that trend is happening everywhere. And the core voters of the mainstream center-left were industrial workers. And so we, we see the peak of support for the center-left in the 1970s and 80s, um, where a lot of parties on the center-left were getting between 25 and 40% of the vote. Um, and a large core of their voters were industrial workers, and the other core were public sector workers. Well, in, the number of industrial workers has collapsed in Europe. That's partly as a result of decline of manufacturing and partly as a result of technological change. So just the number, the core voters, or one of those two pillars of the voters for the Social Democrats have largely disappeared in many countries. And then amongst public sector workers, we're seeing a huge fragmentation of their votes. They're going all over the place. They used to be very solidly behind the mainstream centre-left, but increasingly the votes are going to the Greens or to the Liberals or social liberal parties or some radical left parties or even the mainstream centre-right. So we're seeing a huge fragmentation of the vote that used to be coalesced around one single block, the mainstream centre-left. And so, although if you add up the votes, the left in many countries is still as large as it was 20 years ago. It's just hugely fragmented across a large range of parties. So one of the big challenges is about trying to coordinate voters in the sort of progressive block, if you like. I mean, there's a new project coming out where they call it the progressive field. The progressive field is this broad field of parties who in generally are in favor of higher taxes, a bit more public spending, and social liberalism, pro addressing the environment question, gender equality, pro-migration. The voters, ironically, who vote for green parties, the center left and the radical left, are actually really close together but the parties are all fragmented. And then we look across to the right, and we see their voters are all over the place in what they, what they think about, but they are actually coalescing around two blocks, the centre-right and the radical right. And so we see, for example, in Italy, where I live, they, they were able to form an alliance in the last Italian election, and then Maloney won the Italian election, whereas on the left, the left-wing parties could not get a deal. Their votes fragmented, and they lost the election. Had they co coalesced, they'd have won the election. Um, so, I think maybe a change that we've also seen from the traditional centre-left has to do with immigration, and that we've already hinted on that. Uh, the EU, clearly, um, has a lot uh, on, uh, on immigration. Maloney uh, yep. did the Tunisia deal with our Prime Minister. Um, how do you think, policy-wise, this is going to be influenced? Yeah, so, <laughs> migration is a tricky issue for Europe. I mean, we're seeing a transformation in our societies. Um, and in many countries, the issue of migration is wrapped up with the fact we're aging populations. So, you know, Italy is, is a prime example where it's a real aging population and Italy needs migrants. And economically, the economy is sucking migrants in into jobs. Uh, but the Italian society and the Italian politics and policy is not really caught up with the reality that's Italy today. Um, and so... There's a, a group of voters in Italy and men, in many places in Southern Europe in particular who are resisting what is happening or transforming. And, and the centre-left parties are everywhere going, no, let's not talk about immigration, let's not talk about it, let's pretend it's not happening. Uh, because it's clearly an issue that's owned more by the right. If you talk about, if an election is going to be about immigration, the right are going to win. If the election tends to be about the economy, then the left tend to win. And so when the elections get pitched around immigration, then, then this is why I think it's very difficult, because it overwhelmingly is about how society is changing, social integration policies, how culture is changing, and people resisting that. And part of that is just cultural opposition to changing society, and part of it is competition, is economic competition, competition for public spending, public services, competition for housing, that was a big issue in the Dutch election, competition for school places. I mean, it's ironic, the Brexit debate in Britain, I was traveling around the country on different platforms talking to people about whether they were going to vote you know, for or against Britain leaving the EU. Immigration was the dominant issue, but for most places we went to, the issue was linked very much to public services. People would say, I can't get to see a doctor. I can't get, there's no places in the primary schools anymore. And it's because there'd been cuts in public spending, and so they were then blaming migration for the fact they couldn't do this. But it was largely the fact there'd been cuts in public spending. But it was very easy to blame migrants for, for these things that were happening.
You've mentioned how the the progressives are uh, are fragmented at the European level, but that's also true to some extent yeah. for the right. Um, so you have the ECR, which is center right, and then you have a much more radical right um, identity and democracy. When it comes to immigration policy, so implementing more right-wing Im immigration stances at the European level, do you think that a far-right shift in the European Parliament that you predict will help them coordinate yeah. and implement harsher policies? Yeah, so um, the way to think about this is a lot of what the EU does is done by the governments themselves without the European Parliament. A lot of the big ticket items, so foreign affairs, like the EU position on Ukraine, or EU relations with China or the US, or big EU budgetary questions on economic and monetary union. They're done by the governments sitting in the council. What the European Parliament is involved in is a lot of the legislative stuff for regulating the single market. And so one of the big areas, so there's two really big areas where that matters, and we've seen a lot of legislation over the last decade. One is on environment, and I'll come back to that. And the other one is on, is on migration, which is you know, the EU migration policies, particularly on asylum, rules on asylum and asylum policy, the, what's called the Dublin Convention, which are the rules of the EU that say that you have to apply for asylum in the country that you arrive in first. And so we've had a sort of centrist block in the European Parliament, or a centre-left block even, on both of those policy issues for the last decade, decade and a half. Now, with the shift to the right in the Parliament, we're going to see a block which is a right-wing majority on both of those topics. So, for example, we've seen in the, in the current parliament, the current the sort of 2019 to 2024 parliament, we see a left-right split on both of those questions where the EPP, the centre-right, vote with these two groups to their right, but they lose. Now, we're going to, if the EPP vote with those two groups to the right, they're going to win because our forecasting model is saying we're going to see this big shift to the right, we're going to see this movement in the average member of the parliament, EPP become the pivotal party. If they choose to vote with the right, you're then going to see a majority on environment questions and on, on migration questions. And so therefore, we could see quite much more restrictive migration policies from the EU and much more anti-environment policies from the EU. The farmers will be happy. <laughs> the one thing that you've mentioned is the EU council where countries make policies. I think... One maybe optimistic note some people had um, after Builders won is that not all far right leaders are the same. So Maloney and Orban are not at all similar, but also Orban, with a little bit more trouble, did moderate their stances on NATO, on the EU, largely because of foreign policy issues. So why do you think this would be different. Why do you think they haven't been able to form a block in the EU Council, but the EU, EU Parliament might be a different story? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, so there's two issues there. One is the fact they're all different, and the other one is their general power across the institutions. So I think we're seeing at the European level now what we've seen at the national level in many countries in the following sense. So we've seen the rise of the populist right in a lot of countries, and then it gets to the point where they have actually risen, where now they are actually a major party that people have to do business with. There's, a, they've, there's no longer possible to hold a cordon sanitaire to say, we're not going to do business with these people. Now they reach a point where you have to, they're part of influencing the formation of government. We see exactly that happening right now in the Netherlands. And this has happened in, throughout Scandinavia, it's growing possibility in France with the rise of Le Pen. It's happening in Spain with Vox and PP, the mainstream centre-right, are now talking about perhaps doing a deal with Vox. It's happening you know, in Germany with the rise of the AFD and the big split in the CDU about whether they do business with the AFD. Right? So you see the rise. You get to a point where they've risen, in a sense. Now you have to do business with them. At the European level, it's been the same. We've seen a few leaders in the council. We've seen these groups in the parliament. And mostly people have said we can do business without them, except where they have unanimity in the council and you have to get Orban on board. Now we're going to see a situation where we're going to see a lot more, large, much larger block in the council, sorry, in the parliament. We're going to see more leaders in the council and we're going to see commissioners from these populist right parties, from the European Conservative and Reformists. The other interesting thing, of course, is they're actually starting to coalesce on the right. So for years, Law and Justice, the Polish populist right party, would never do business with Orban. They had to sit in different groups in the parliament. Why? Because Law and Justice hate Putin and Orban likes Putin. So they would never do business with each other. 
Now that Polish party, it lost the last Polish election and it's the main opposition party. Now they're in opposition. They've said to Orban, why don't you come and sit with us in the European Parliament? So we never thought this would happen. They're willing to hold their nose and do business together. Why? Because if they can do business together, they're going to have more power. So the carrot of having power is actually a big incentive for them to get together. So I'm expecting they're going to be much more influential and we're going to see much more coordination between these groups of leaders on the right. We're going to see... We're going to see several of them in the council, and they might in, decide to have meetings prior to council meetings in the way the Social Demo Socialists and Democrats and the way that the, the EPP have meetings before council meetings. I can imagine the populist right might start to have meetings before council meetings. You can imagine, you know, Wilders perhaps getting together with Orban, getting together with Maloney, getting together with Le Pen, with Law and Justice. You know, if they, they could easily start to meet before council meetings and then start to coordinate what their positions are going to be in the parliament and what their position is going to be in the commission and what their position is going to be in the council. If they start to do that, that's real transformation in the way EU politics works. So then you have, you have a stronger, more coordinated right. You have a weaker, more fragmented left. How much do you see that fragmented, not even left, let's even say center, shifting towards the right? That's a good question because the key group to watch is this center-right EPP group, and they are split down the middle on whether they do business with the populist right. Um, you see some, there's a sort of more liberal wing in that block, like the Irish Fine Gael or some of the Scandinavian parties who say, we don't, we don't want to do any business with them. And then you have other parties who are actually in government at the national level already with them. Forza Italia in Italy is in government with Meloni. You see in several other countries, the centre-right are leaning towards perhaps forming coalitions with these parties, the Partido Popular in Spain or the right-wing party in Portugal, thinking about forming coalitions with Chega, the new populist right party in Portugal. Um, we see big, deep divisions in France, of course, between the Republicans, the centre-right and, and Le Pen. Um, and the big one to watch is Germany, the German CDU. German CDU now in opposition, and the big question for them is, uh, the, the big fight going on in the party now, is are they going to do business with the AFD? The AFD, don't know if Deutschland, are going to probably come second in these European Parliament elections after the CDU. The, cent the centre-left are going to be down a lot in Germany. Yeah, there's going to be some Land elections, so that's the regional parliament elections in Germany. There's three of them coming up this year. The AFD are likely to be the largest party in each of those parliaments. And if they're the largest party in each of those parliaments, the question is going to be to the CDU, are you going to form government with them or are they going to govern on their own with you supporting them on the back benches? And there's growing incentives for the regional parties in those parliaments to form or to allow the AFD to govern. If that, if that happens, that will not only have resonance or, or repercussions in Berlin, that's going to have repercussions in Brussels because the CDU are the biggest party inside this centre-right bloc, and if they start to pitch rightwards. And we're already, of course, the commission president is from the CDU now. Ursula von der Leyen is, wants to stand to be commission president again. She's already... Those votes, then. She depends on those votes, and she, she is lean, starting to lean rightwards. You know, she, she was elected five mm -hmm. years ago with a bloc that was on the centre and the left. Mm -hmm. So it was the EPP in coalition with the Liberals, the Socialists, and the Greens. That, in a sense, was, if you like, her governing coalition that she built when she was elected. So the commission president is put forward before, after the European elections, has to be formally elected by a majority in the parliament. The majority that she put together was that centre-centre-left majority. And that's been her governing majority, if you like, over the last five years, with sort of shifting on different issues. Um, now, we saw, in response to the farmers' protests all across Europe, she immediately said oh, yeah, we're going to backtrack rapidly on a lot of this environmental stuff. And the socialists and the Greens went, what? We passed all this stuff. You promised us all this stuff. And you're now saying we're going to backpedal. There's no way we're going to vote for you again. So you can see there's not going to be such plain sailing for her, I think, in this new parliament. It might not be so easy for her to command a majority. And if she does command a majority, it could get quite nasty if that majority is EPP plus ECR plus ID plus Fidesz. From Hungary. That's a majority of seats. If she relies on that majority in the parliament, we're going to see a really, really dramatic left-right shift or left-right split in European politics going forward. So how worried should we be about this development? How worried should we be? Yeah. Well, 
it depends who you vote for, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, I think it's not good f for European politics for there to be such a deep cleavage. You need consensus. It's very difficult to get things done. I worry more about gridlock, uh, in a sense. When you think about all of the major issues we are face facing in our continent, whether it's you know, trying to create jobs in the single market, and that we, that we need to regenerate growth in the European economy, particularly in the services sector. We need to think ab about how are we going to address the fact that we are a de facto multi-ethnic, multi-religious continent right now. What are the positive policies we're going to do? We need it. We're an aging continent. Um, how are we going to address you know, climate change, which is coming fast and influencing a lot of our societies very quickly? How are we going to reduce our emissions. What are we going to do about Ukraine? What are we going to do about potentially Trump in the White House? Uh, you know, so there's a lot of really big issues that we need to address collectively in Europe, and Euro the European institutions are the vehicle through which we do that. If these institutions are gridlocked with a kind of European Parliament that can't do business, splits in the Council, splits in the Commission, that worries me more the, the fact that you cannot actually build consensus to get things done and what actually the EU will be doing. I think this is a great time to look at our audience, to see some audience questions. I see one right there. Hey, super cool that you are here. Um, you just now touched upon it a little bit. Uh, I The whole time I was thinking I need to ask about the EU enlargement, uh, which you mentioned Ukraine, which is the most straightforward question, right? Do you think that uh, Ukraine will be accepted or not? Or if it's going to be gridlock, you've hinted at it a bit. But also, how do you think the differences between different countries of the EU having different stances on the different candidate countries? I think that's super interesting. You know, if you consider Moldova, Bosnia, Herzegovina, different countries have different stances, and it's quite a yeah intense topic, I think, right now. So yeah, yeah, it's a really it's difficult one to predict. Um, I think my expectation right now is it's not going to happen quickly. I think, you know, it's clear that some of the applicant states are really much more advanced than others. So Montenegro, we just saw yesterday, the president was saying, you know, we're ready actually to join the EU. We can take the UK seat as the 28th member. We want to join now. Uh, I don't think that's going to be an easy decision for the EU institutions, because if you let one in, why would you not let a load of the others in as well? Um, and of course, Ukraine is, is the elephant in the room. So, so I think what we're seeing, though, is a shift in the debate about a large enlargement from it really being a kind of managerial type issue for a long time, have you met the criteria to join and so on, um, to now being a geopolitical, st geostrategic issue. And I think uh, once it moves to that, actually, if they collectively decide because of the, the threat of Putin and because of the potential threat of what happens in the American elections, Europe needs to be stronger, Europe needs to be united. That could push a much faster enlargement. That would be massively disruptive on the day-to-day -day business of the EU, and I think that could again lead to gridlock, as I'm saying. They will have to reform the institutions internally, and I, I, it's much harder to reform the institutions with 27 member states than it was when there was only 12 or 15. So I'm not optimistic we're gonna see enlargement quickly. I hope we do. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, as you say, there's big splits internally between the various member states and heads of government and, and, and big splits amongst those populist right leaders who some of them want them in, some of them, Le Pen would say, no way, but if you ask Orban or Law and Justice, they say, yeah, get them all in, right? So you can see how they're, they're that's one of the issues on which they really are deeply divided. Uh, so this touches on uh, EU foreign policy, which, you know, officially the EU doesn't have one uh, foreign policy. So I think we talk a lot about the rise of Euroscepticism and maybe the shift to the right. Um, but if we want to talk about the way that will impact our institu institutions, I think it's important to also know, let's look at the historical backing of those institutions, right? So Winston Churchill, when he talked about the United States of Europe, wasn't particularly uh, shy in his ambition for Europe. Um, a lot of institutions, economists would point out, actually necessitate a lot further integration. So as soon as you have one common currency, you know, more transfers are bound to follow. So how much room really is there to undo a lot of that integration project given how much of the institutions necessitate for their integration? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't think we're going to see either a major roll back in the integration process or a major step forward. I think we have reached an institutional equilibrium. There'll be some tinkering around the edges. I don't see a major 
package step forward like the Single European Act or the Maastricht Treaty or even the Lisbon Treaty because there isn't the appetite for that. There isn't, there's a lot you can actually do in the EU institutions. And when you think about these populist right parties, their position on that question has evolved. So a decade ago, these parties were in favor of leaving the EU or leaving the single currency. Um, you know, you, part, Wilders was talking about Nexit or Le Pen Frexit or, or, you know, and after, maybe it's because Brexit has gone so badly for the UK, nobody's talking about it anymore. Um, but I think it, there's another side to it, which is that these, as these parties have grown in size and as they've seen that they can influence what the EU does, they think actually, we can use the EU to get what we want. So we can turn, that, it's not that they're opposed to the EU, they're opposed to what the EU is doing and they want their own version of the EU. They want a different EU. Yeah, they want to hand some powers back to the member states, but they want to use the EU institutions to stop being so pro-environment, to be more restrictive on, Im on immigration. In a sense, they want the EU to be a sort of fortress Europe. If you ask Maloney what she would want from the EU, she would want build barriers, stop migrants coming in, and be protectionist on economics. That would be a kind of Trumpian version of the EU, if you like. You know, Trump, if he wins, is going to introduce massive trade barriers, then we'll start a new trade war, and I think Europe would introduce trade barriers, you know, in opposition, in response to that. And, all, you know, Trump's policies on migration into the US are exactly the same as the kind of policies on migration into Europe, a lot of these parties, and they would need to get power at the European level to enforce those types of policies. And they're realizing that that could actually happen. So they actually, re there's been a transformation from uh, over the last decade of these parties being anti-European to now being anti the current EU policy and in favor of something different. So they want a different sort of EU, not to get rid of the EU. So going back a little bit to um, foreign policy as well, um, a lot of key actors, von der Leyen, for example, have been pushing to take a more active stance on Ukraine. Um, and then there's also pushback. Um, but do you think the EU is ready specifically for that more active role? Yeah, so uh, let's think about the counterfactual, right? So if we roll back to a few years ago, two and a half years ago, um, would you have predicted that if... Putin invades Ukraine, Europe would be so coordinated in its response. You'd have said no way, right? You'd have said no way. Uh, and hence, that was kind of what Putin was gambling on. There's no way the Americans will intervene. There's no way Europe's are going to get their act together. You know, it's easy pickings. And it's been quite a surprise, I think, that the EU has managed to be so united in its policy towards Ukraine, and even united in its policy towards Ukraine with rising energy prices. So, you know, it, perhaps you could say they weren't going to be united. Then you'd say, yeah, but they can be united, but they can be anti, you know, they can provide aid and they can agree to send some money. But as soon as it starts to really cost them with the price of gas and electricity going up, that's going to fragment. We went through the winter, last winter, with energy prices going through the roof. And everyone was predicting European voters are going to get really angry. And then, the, you know, if Putin says, do a peace deal with me and you can have cheap gas again you know, then the European coalition is going to fragment. That didn't happen. So it's been surprising to me actually how united Europe has maintained in the face of that threat. The next thing is going to be defense. And so with whoever is going to win the US election in the autumn, um, whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden, there's going to be facing a Congress that is going to be very skeptic towards NATO. Um, so we could see the Republicans winning majorities in both houses of Congress, even if Biden wins the presidency. Um, and then if Trump wins the presidency, of course, you've got unified government and you could see dramatic transformation of NATO. I think it was a, somebody a few weeks ago said, I'm not, you know, when asked, if Trump wins in the US, you're worried about American democracy. He said, no, I'm not worried about American democracy. I'm worried about Estonian democracy, which is if Trump wins in the White House and Trump says, I'm not going to protect Europe, I'm not going to invoke Article 5 of our mutual defense uh, in the NATO treaty, I'm not going to respect it, you know, Putin will take the Baltic states back. That's the worry. Uh, so fearing that and fearing the fact the US is really turning its attention to Asia and saying, this is your backyard, Europe. You have to look after it. The big challenge all across Europe is going to massively increase in defense spending. We're going to have to figure out how we do that. We're going to have to raise taxes. We're going to have to spend more money. We're going to have to train troops. We're going to have to build tanks. That's what we're going to have to do in Europe in the next decade. And I think that's the key issue 
that I think is going to drive European politics in the next decade. And do you think the surprising cohesion so far makes you optimistic of our ability to do so? Yeah, or? it does, actually. I, I think it does. And I, I, I think we're seeing a far more unified position in Europe on these questions than a decade ago. We've seen a transformation in Germany's position, of course. And it's actually much closer to France, in a way, in terms of thinking about European defense, thinking about the role Europe, Europe should be taking in terms of troops and support. So, so you know, it was always France and Britain uh, having a much more militarist view of, of and Germany saying, we're happy to pay for it, but we don't want to get involved in troops. And now I think that has changed quite dramatically. And of course, the other reason why I'm a little bit optimistic about this is as a Brit, right? So, you know, Brexit for me is, is very painful, but you, Britain will inevitably have to be part of some defense community that is being built in Europe. And it's interesting that, you know, Macron created this new institution that brings together all of the, right across Europe, brings our continent together in a new meeting once a year, a, a summit meeting, where, you know, that's potentially a vehicle through which there could be a new architecture. Because remember, the EU is just part of Europe. The EU is not all of Europe. And all of these questions, whether it's defense, migration, climate change, or even the economy, are actually beyond the borders of the EU. So, you know, it involves Western Europeans, Switzerland, Norway, the UK, Iceland. A lot of Eastern Europe, as we've said, are not members of the EU. We don't really have a good architecture for governing our continent in general on these questions. The EU is not the only solution to that. We need to think beyond. Nobody's thinking creatively enough about how do we actually build a European defense community that is beyond the borders of the EU, because that is going to be the next big challenge. Because a lot of people are also saying that the key member states that the EU would have to rely on for a bigger defense program um, are being too conservative about this. You're saying this is about a broader coalition that can help defend them. Yeah, I think it, they're being conservative about this, uh, but I think the public attitudes are changing quite dramatically. I think the public is realizing that we, ch we do need to be spending more money on defense. We do need to increase what percent of public expenditure we spend on defense. I think there's a growing incentive in Europe to have a sort of uh, Europe-first manufacturing of defense products and defense procurement type stuff. And so that can go hand in hand with we increase defense spending, but it's also boosting the economy the way the Americans do it. American defense spending is a welfare policy, essentially. You know, the reason why Congress is willing to spend all that money on defense is because it, it built its factories, its, its welfare programs for troops, its health care for troops and their families. I mean, essentially, it's a welfare policy. And so I think depending on how you package what defense spending is, it can actually be a boost to the European economy. Um, so, well, now we're on the topic of defense. There's one party that's no like notably much less cooperative, which is Viktor Orban. Um, during Ukraine ex ascension talks, uh, Schultz famously asked Orban to quote leave the, leave the room to kind of, as you already mentioned, like sidestep these far right elements, uh, regardless from their ability to do so like later down the line. Um, a lot of people have said that this sets quite a dangerous precedent. How do you feel about that debate? Well, I think you could say it sets a dangerous precedent, or you could say it sets a positive precedent, because it means that Europe is thinking about the fact that on some of these big questions, we need to move beyond unanimity. You know, it's not fair that one state, or even a couple of states, can hold the others to ransom on some of these really big questions particularly in an EU of 27 or could be 35 member states. We move to 35 member states, which could happen over the next decade. There's no way we're going to be able to use unanimity to make all of these big decisions. And so unanimity minus one, unanimity minus two. I think new norms are going to develop. And it'll be based around norms rather than, rather than around you know, the formal treaty rules themselves, because the treaty rules themselves are really difficult to change. So unanimity formally in the way the EU works legally is actually, if you abstain, it doesn't count against unanimity. It's still unanimous. So you know, norms can develop that you don't vote against, you abstain. You're opposed to this, you abstain. You're allowed to go home and say, we didn't back this, or we weren't, we're not going to pay for this, or we're not going to belong to this. And so that's where I think you're going to see an evolution in some of these areas towards a new set of norms about how Europe is governing itself on a lot of these issues. Okay, I think we have time for one more audience question over here. 
Uh, you pick, Max. Oh, thank you. Um, what do you what do you expect will be the main policy focus of a commission and a parliament that will considerably move to the right? And more specifically for the case of trade, is there a case to be made for more protectionist um, policy? And if so, what are those implications? Yeah, so on the second of those questions, I think a lot of that would depend on what happens in the US election in the autumn. So I think, you know, we like to think of the US as the global free traders, but in fact, Europe are far more global free traders than the Americans are. Historically, it's been Europe that has been supporting the global uh, WTO, the US, uh, not just Trump, but other previous American presidents have used the WTO as a vehicle to promote American trade. And when it's not favored them, they've been more critical of, of international trading regimes. And it tends to be Europe that's much more benefiting from global free trade than the US. And we're seeing the US becoming more and more protectionist. If the US becomes even more protectionist after the next US election, I think we're going to see a lot more support in Europe for Europe taking the same kind of step uh, in that direction. It, it's not in anybody's interest in the long run. You might say in the short run it's good. Europe protects European manufacturers or European trade. But Europe doesn't manufacture very much. Europe is largely a services sector economy. So, and you know, restrictions on trade is not really what Europe needs to be able to sell its services globally. If you think of what Europe's global comparative advantage in, it's it, it services sector and its culture and it, it's some high-end manufacturing. But protecting those things, I think, doesn't, doesn't really serve the European economy very well. So I do worry about sort of global trade wars uh, between the EU, the US, and China and what that would do for the European economy in trying to get the European economy moving. The only way to make that work is we'd have to subsidize a lot of industries much more to get the economy moving. And I, I don't see anybody willing to pay higher taxes to do that. So, so I am worried about, about where that's heading. Uh, the first question is, is more right-wing parliament, what is it going to do in, in policy terms? I think in the next commission, the next commission is really going to have to focus on economic growth. Um, economic growth was going to be the, the, the focus of this commission when she took over. Economic growth and environment. And then she was thrown off course by, uh, by COVID and thrown off course by, by then the Ukraine crisis. And so the focus has been on a sort of emergency things on healthcare, buying vaccines and emergency things on the Ukraine, the Ukraine budget. And then the previous commission, it was the financial crisis and then the migration crisis. So in a sense, they've taken their eye off the ball when it comes to how do we generate growth in the single market? How do we open up the services economy in particular? Most new jobs... And the European economy are small businesses in the service sector. So, you know, whether it's a film, fashion, design, art, architecture, I mean, uh, you know, new social media, uh, this is what, these are all the new jobs being created in the European economy. We need to work out how can we really revolutionize that, those sectors. Nobody's thinking on a European scale on those things, and that's what needs to be done, I think. In addition, of course, to defense, we've talked about already. But I, I think economy and economic growth is going to have to be a major focus of the next commission. Would you say then that, that both for defense but also for economic growth, Europe has faced all these crises, you can call it the poly crises, over the past 10, 20 years. It's now time to kind of, I mean, we're still in crises, but it's time to kind of think of a mission, to think of what Europe wants going forward. Yeah, I mean, what is the, what's the EU for? I mean, it really was created as both a security community and an economic community. At the beginning, it was about not having war, and it was about regenerating our economies. And that, but that's those two things have not gone away, if you like. They're, that those are the core missions of the project from the beginning. Um, you know, and in fact, you say we've had. A, I remember when um, we had Brexit, and I was asked to give a uh, come and talk about Brexit uh, to the LSE Alumni Association in Greece, and you know, the, lots of Greek alumni from the London School of Economics. On the front row was Simitis, the former prime minister, and the, the central bank governor, and then the president of the University of Athens, and so on. And I gave a, I gave a talk about what's happening with Brexit. And this is the economics of Brexit. This is the politics of Brexit. And, and I, I showed the economic models of what's, what could happen, what the costs would be to Britain. And Simitis, the former Greek prime minister, asked the first question. And he said, so, Professor Hicks, in the worst case scenario, Brexit is going to cost the British economy 5% of GDP. And I said, yeah, that's right. That's what the models say. And he went, <laughs> meaning we've just had a loss of 25% <laughs> of Greek GDP and we survived. 5%, you can get over that, 
right? So, so we're now, Britain is almost back to where it was. It's still, but it's growing still. What's remarkable, we are, we are a wealthy continent globally. And in fact, despite all these crises, we have survived these crises. We've come out the other end of these crises. We are still creating jobs. We need to think how we can regenerate growth. We've really started to transform our economies on environment. And we've started to think creatively about infrastructure in ways that we hadn't done before. So I'm optimistic about where I think we're heading in policy terms in Europe um, now that we come out of the kind of poly crises that we've had over the last decade. I'm generally an optimist. <laughs> Well, that's nice. It's refreshing. Um, I think we can s connect some dots then. Um, we have growing Euroscepticism amongst voters, um, whereas institutions, you have a bit of a mix, but favoring um, integration. And then at the elite level, we have a push and a pull for both of these sides. We had Giorgios Papa Constantino on our stage um, earlier this year. And he has spoken about five forms that Europe could take. So his scale goes from the most integrated version being called the United States of Europe, and then the least integrated version being the end of Europe. Given all these disagreements, everything we've talked about, where do you see Europe going and where would you like to see it going? Oh, I'd like to see United States of Europe. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have no shame in saying that, you know, I'm in favor of federal design for Europe. I, th I, th I can see why people find that a bit scary, potentially. But federalism is not, uh, you know, a unitary state. It allows huge amounts of flexibility within it. I think we do. But in a sense, we have a quasi-federal system already. It's not that far from it. Where do I think, what I think is going to happen? I, don't, I think the equilibrium we have for the design of the institutions is really, really stable and really, really flexible. In fact, you know, we've seen every time there is a crisis, everyone says, this is the end of the EU. And I always say to my students, never underestimate the ability of the EU to find a way to muddle through. And every crisis that happens, when we, you remember the vaccines, and oh, Britain and America are overtaking Europe, and we're way behind in the vaccines, and and guess what happened? They figured out a way to do it, and, and then Europe rolled out all these vaccines all across Europe. And, and there never would have been vaccines in a lot of the smaller member states, so they're not been the EU institutions, because the big ones would have been able to purchase all the global vaccines, and the smaller states wouldn't. And in fact, we managed to vaccinate everyone in our continent incredibly quickly and incredibly efficiently, efficiently and beat COVID, right? So, and again, Ukraine, Ukraine crisis, Europe's going to be split, Europe's going to be divided. It remains united, and we managed to actually stop Putin in Ukraine, taking over Ukraine. Well done, bravo Europe. So, I mean, uh, with the migration crisis, that's going to be the end of Europe. The financial crisis, that's going to be the end of Europe. None of it has been the end of Europe. We're still here. We still have the EU institutions. They're incredibly flexible. They work. I am worried about gridlock as a result of the rise in the populist right. So then the EU is, finds it more difficult to address the next crisis because of that gridlock. That's why I find that more worrying. But I'd like the fact the EU is lots of checks and balances, but finds a way to muddle through by building consensus, broad consensus across member states, broad consensus across different political families and ideologies. And so I don't think Europe's going to change dramatically from that equilibrium. So you would say Europe continues in its state of inspirationally modeling, modeling through. I like, really like that as an idea. Yeah, I mean, look, I, it's, it's interesting actually look, watching the public opinion polls. We're actually seeing public support for Europe in many, many countries actually ticking up over the last, you know, four or five years, where Europe has said, the public has said, it's not so bad, really, right? You know, what, what's the alternative? And Europe does constrain member states, and we saw big declines in support for European integration after the financial crisis, because people blame Brussels. We saw big declines in support for European integration after the migration crisis, particularly in southern Europe, because people said the rest of Europe's not helping us with the crisis. But with Ukraine, following COVID, following Brexit, following the Ukraine crisis, we've seen a growth in public support for European integration, as the public has realized, actually, we couldn't have addressed these crises without the European institutions. So uh, starting to wrap up, for those of us who can't get enough of EU talk, um, an hour is good, and I think we've talked about a lot. But if you could recommend one book or one paper that you think is instrumental for people to understand the EU better, what do you think it would do for some self-study after this? 
Wow, that's a really tough question. Um, what do we do here? I don't think I don't think I can't. I don't think there's any one book. I like uh, Luke van Middelaar's book on on the crises in Europe and and how Europe has is is now a little bit old. It's a few years old. In terms of people to follow or people to watch who comment on this and write and get involved very much, I, I think Catherine de Vries is Dutch, but she's a Bocconi. She's talking and saying very interesting things about Europe and where Europe's heading. And Catherine and I, I think, share a lot of views about where we're heading. Invite Catherine to come and give it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure to do that. But you also said at the start, when I asked you what inspires someone to study EU institutions, you said you've done some other things as well. So do you have a book recommendation completely different from this? Well, I know you've had him here already, but Piketty. I think Piketty is, is transformational. Uh, he's transformational, you know, maybe not all his books. They're way too thick to read, sadly. Uh, but but I, think, I think he's transformed the social sciences, and I think he's raised a really serious, important question, which is a refocus on inequality. Mm -hmm. And inequality, I think, has now become a core subject of all of the social sciences, not just in a sense it was a big... Uh, subjects in sociology, but to make it a mainstream subject in economics, I think, is transformational for the discipline of economics, and so, as a result, transformational for the discipline. So, so if there's one book or set of books that I think has, has been most transformative for me in thinking about where the social sciences are heading, it's, it's, it's Thomas Piketty. And it's only 1,200, 1,300 pages per book, so it should be fun. <laughs> um, thank you so much uh, for coming, uh, Simon. Also, thank you to your audience for coming and asking very nice questions. Uh, there's a bunch of things coming up. So March 11th, we have Sir Nick Cagnell. Um, um, sorry. Um, <laughs> Sir Nick Clegg. Nick Clegg, I know. <laughs> Sir Nick Clegg, uh, the global head of global affairs for Meta, the former um, deputy prime minister of the UK. Uh, then the next day is uh, Dr. Brighton Claus. And then after, the CEO of KLM uh, on March uh, 14th. Look, there's just a lot of interesting uh, talks coming up. And if you like... Well, you guys, these guys invite interesting guests. I would like to talk to them. Luckily, you can do so. Recruitment is open. Please apply. Go to our website, scan it on the banner, which I think is that one. We would love to have you, or it's there. Um, we would love to see you, um, and we'd love to meet you. So thank you so much, uh, and thank you again, Simon Hicks. Thank you.